Hello, and welcome to lesson two in our English 201 course. I'm very excited about this lesson because we have completed a lot of the introductory content in the first lesson, you know, going over the syllabus and the course requirements, that kind of stuff. And with this lesson, we can really start diving into content. I'm also excited because I very much enjoyed reading your discussion board posts. So I'm excited to go through this lesson with you for all of us to learn more. And then most importantly, for me to get the opportunity to read more of your work. As you can see, this lesson is called Revisiting Critical Reading. This is the second of our lessons and also our second lesson where we're revisiting a fundamental concept from English 101. So last week we talked in detail about the concept of rhetoric, which is really the study of how communication works, how people effectively persuade others in their communications and interactions so that we can hone and develop our own strategies for effective communication and persuasion. Obviously a fundamental concept to English 101 and English 201. You can see why we've covered it right at the beginning in both classes. Critical reading, as the second thing we're discussing, is really one of the most important aspects of rhetoric. I'm going to talk in more detail about this in a few slides once we get into the lesson and get into talking about critical reading specifically. But just real quickly, I'll say that being able to read well helps one be able to write well, subsequently communicate well. And Moreover, a part of rhetoric, as I mentioned a minute ago, is understanding how others communicate with us and try to persuade us. So being able to take a critical eye, uh, dare I say a skeptical eye, to things we read and things we see, particularly important in our culture, is uh, just absolutely fundamental, essential, foundational um, to growing as a critical consumer who analyzes media, scrutinizes it, and then produces their own compositions to engage in the culture. So that's why we're taking some time revisiting critical reading. Uh, the first half of this lecture, part one, will be review of English 101 and the basically the fundamental aspects and key strategies of critical reading that I covered in 101. So again, if you've taken my 101 class, that part of the lecture will seem very familiar. The second half of the lecture, though, will be completely new to you, even if you have taken my 101 course, because I'm going to do an example of critical reading in the second half of the lecture uh, of a piece of writing you haven't read before. To go into to a little more detail on the overview of the lecture before we get started, like I said, part one will be complete review of critical reading from 101. But part two is where we really deviate. So I've got three topics I'm going to cover in part two. As you may have read on the syllabus, a big part of this course will be the study of superheroes and comic books. You might be wondering why. The syllabus addresses that. But with the emergence of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the sheer popularity of the Marvel franchise, superheroes and their their origin point, comic books, have become completely ubiquitous in our culture. They're hugely popular and culturally influential. But I think one of the great things about these larger-in-life characters we see in the superhero genre is that even with all of their powers, the best superheroes are still human at their core. And as they grapple with villains, even cosmic villains, they engage with um, personal, social, and cultural issues that we can all relate to, that we go through ourselves. And so that can make studying those things fun in a different way. Superheroes can be a conduit, if you will, to studying the most important things we study in this class. So on one level, superheroes are an important part of this class. They're a tool, a conduit, if you will, to study the concepts we're going to study through a more fun lens. Um, but I would not necessarily say they're a theme for this course. They're more of a, a conduit for learning. 
The theme for this course is the first of the three things listed here, fake news. Again, you might be asking why. Well, as I mentioned before, an important part of English 101 and especially English 201 is learning to analyze media and be a more skeptical or critical consumer of media so that we understand how others are trying to persuade us. An important part of rhetoric, rhetoric critical reading is foundational to being able to do that. So one way this course builds on what you've learned in English 101, but goes in a new direction and gives you new things to learn, is that we're going to study fake news and what I call media literacy in greater depth and detail than we did in 101. <clears throat> so that you understand um, in 2021 or really 2022, reading something is very different than reading it 30, 50, 40, or even less, even five or 10 years ago, um, because something that presents itself as truthful may be, may be trying to manipulate you. And so becoming more media literate, how to understand when we're not only, when someone's not only trying to persuade us, but maybe even trying to manipulate us is kind of a layer added to this course that was not there in one-on-one. And so fake news is the theme for this course and superheroes are a conduit to understanding that theme as well as all the foundational concepts such as rhetoric, critical reading, etc. So fake news explanation I just gave of the first of the three things we're going to cover in part two. Um, we need an example of critical reading for this lecture. So I've chosen really two examples. One is a film, Spider-Man Far From Home, which you should be able to rent for not very expensive. If you just rent it and watch it online, it can be as cheap as $3 if you get it in standard definition from Amazon. So while this class technically has no textbooks, there is that slight cost to watch the film Spider-Man Far From Home for this lesson. Um, so Spider-Man Far From Home is one of our examples. And then two, our second example is a really great paper a student wrote in one of my classes before on the film Spider-Man Far From Home, it's an analysis of it, and, and this student's analysis really shows how um, that film illustrates exactly what I've been saying about superheroes throughout this lecture, how that film speaks to our cultural struggles right now. In fact, the paper is actually called The Cultural Struggle. So you get two examples for critical reading, a film and an analysis of the film written by a student. So one of my former students, an example of the type of paper you can write in this class if you work hard and, and learn the skills we're working on learning in this class. And um, this will serve a couple of examples. The essay itself will be a great illustration of what I'm talking about in this lecture with critical reading. Uh, but the film itself deals with the kind of manipulation that can happen in our culture. So it really ties into fake news. And then finally, in this day and age, critical reading should go beyond just the written word. If you took my 101 class when we first studied critical reading in there, I heavily emphasized the written word so that students would, would really hone their critical reading skills. And later in 101, we moved into more visual analysis critically reading images and films and television, et cetera. Here, we're jumping into the visual analysis right away so that um, because you're ready for it, you, you, this is just a review of critical reading. You should already know it fairly well from one-on-one -on -one, so you can get right to the visual aspect and hence we're watching a film. So in part two of the lecture, I'll do kind of a demonstration of how to critically read the student example essay, The Cultural Struggle, but then in the discussion board post, you'll get to do some visual critical reading when you analyze the Spider-Man film. Um, but with all of that overview out of the way, let's jump in and talk about what exactly critical reading is. Um, because you might not remember, and it's such an important concept, we can never review it too much. So what is critical reading and how do you do it? Um, I picked this image here because I think it really shows some important key differences between critical and non-critical reading. I think the most important thing to understand at first is that when you read something, there's not just one way to read things. 
And so what are the differences? I think the most important difference here is the first one listed, that critical reading is active rather than passive. If you think about those words and what they mean in other contexts and then apply that understanding to reading, the definition of critical reading becomes very clear. So if you have to make a decision and you say, well, you know, I don't really care. Like your your friends say to you, what movie should we see or where should we go for dinner? And you say, ah, it doesn't matter to me. That's being passive, right? But if you say, I would really like to go to Zips because I think they have the best food and it's worth spending a little bit more money than going to McDonald's, there you're being very active. So non-critical reading would just be reading without really engaging with the material, whereas critical reading would be engaging, thinking about what the material is saying, whether you agree or not, having a purpose while you read. Um, for instance, we might use critical reading not necessarily all of the time, but in, in different examples. So uh, I read all kinds of different things, and I, I like to read, as I mentioned in Lecture 1, um, articles about the NFL because I love football. You know, I'm not necessarily doing critical reading when I read those, but when I read all kinds of other things, like a lot of the articles I assigned for this class, I, I'm taking a more active, engaged role in my reading. Um, non-critical reading really leads you to at most just summary. Like if you ask me what an NFL article is about, I would say, here's what the writer said. Um, but a more critical reading, I would answer questions like what, how, why. Um, the what is just the facts and the how and the why go beyond that. So why did this person write the article and how did they do how did they try to achieve that purpose or that goal? Kind of like rhetorical analysis. Um, Non-critical reading, um, it's not necessarily that you're gullible, but more so that you're not reading um, with a skeptical eye. And, and skeptical, I mean, you don't just believe things right away. You don't just take everything the article or the piece you're reading says um, for granted, you think, well, well, maybe I don't believe this, and here's why. And then finally, critical reading, you have a purpose when you read critically. There's a goal. I'm reading this because. And having a goal, I think, <clears throat> the first thing here and the last thing are related. Having a goal when you read, having a purpose, makes the reading active. Now, you might be asking, why do critical reading? I said a few things earlier, like it's one of the most fundamental, important skills to learn uh, when starting out in college, which is part of why we cover an English 101. More importantly, it's, it's fundamental to rhetoric, to understanding how people are communicating with you and growing as a communicator yourself, trying to create change. Uh, but I would just like, before we move on, to add one more reason why we do critical reading. Like I said before in, in lesson one, I think I had this graphic in lesson one, but reading and writing, sir, a symbiotic, actually really even more so a cyclical relationship. So there's numerous, like dozens, maybe even hundreds of studies out there that show really active, engaged reading makes one a better writer and really working on your writing, trying to become a better writer makes one a better reader. And so this class is, is mainly about writing. It's a composition class, but this graphic shows why reading is a fundamental part of a writing class. It's really when it's called composition, people think it's a writing class, but it really has to be like 50% reading in order for students to improve in their writing because of what this graphic reflects. Um, <clears throat> which in my own experience and, and over a decade of working with students, um, that experience as well, I really believe this, this statement is true. And lastly, I'll just add kind of deepening what I said earlier about it being a fundamental skill to learn in college. Um, as you take other classes and other departments, maybe even for your major, you're going to have to do a lot of reading. So, so be in reading dense um, text that may not be uh, 
readily accessible. So learning these skills and honing them in English 101 and 201 can really help you thrive on other classes. <clears throat> so hopefully now we know what critical reading is. Let's talk about how you actually do it. Um, so here are some strategies. And then in part two of the lecture, I'm actually going to take the Anderson article and do these strategies, show them to you, like demonstrate them. So first is adjusting your reading speed. Like I said earlier, one of the main points of this lecture, kind of fundamental to buying into the idea of critical reading, if you buy into it, is the idea that there's more than one way to read something. And so likewise, there's more than one speed at which to read something. Now this becomes really important, right? I can read an article about the NFL super quickly. And I should say there's a lot of really good in-depth, hard-hitting articles about the NFL that one can read critically. And I've brought those into class before, but I'm talking about just knowing who is injured or not on my favorite team, right? I can read that super fast. <clears throat> but like the articles I teach in this class, you know, when I chose them, I read a lot of articles to decide which are the best ones. If I read those at the same speed as I try to figure out who's injured on my favorite team, I would not understand them. I would not have a good reading comprehension of them. And so for the more challenging things, especially when you're reading critically, you want to go more slowly. Annotating. Um, I could put these statistics on the, on the screen like I did for the relationship between reading and writing, but kind of just applying that at another level, writing while you read. So there's tons of studies out there, again, dozens or hundreds that show <clears throat> you remember something better if you write it down while you read it. <clears throat> and it can be great to go back and look at your notes, but just the act of writing something down, even if you never look at it again, will help you remember it better than if you don't write anything. So keep that pen busy in the margins. And even if you're reading, if you don't print the articles out, if you're reading them just on a screen, you can make notes in like a Word document or on a piece of paper while you're reading, um, you know, whatever's best, but write things down while you read. Now we get into, those are two activities you can actually do while reading. With these next bullet points, we get more into what would go on mentally, <clears throat> what you would think about <clears throat> after you read or, or as you read, but really more the analysis and reflection part of it. So the first level of thinking here is summarizing, but in your own words. So here you're not giving any kind of commentary, not giving your opinion, um, because that comes later in the process but being able to say what the article said in your own words. And that's the key term because we can quote all day long, but quoting doesn't demonstrate any knowledge. I can say something to you that's a quote and have no idea what it means. But if I take that quote or that idea encapsulated by the quote and explain what it means in my own words, <clears throat> then I demonstrate that I've truly understood it. And this is really important. When you write your papers for the classes, for our class, I mean, you're welcome to quote, but I don't recommend quoting extensively, especially when you're citing research. I, I wanna see that you've understood what you read. So a lot more paraphrasing than quoting will really demonstrate your knowledge um, better than just quoting. The next step after summarizing is analysis. So. What does it mean? Why is it important going a little bit deeper? And there's some specific ways to do those. The first would be identifying the rhetorical situation. So here's a more obviously direct link to our first lesson on rhetoric, but all of those things we went over last time, like what is the rhetorical situation? What is the author's purpose or goal? Who is their audience? How do they try to achieve that goal? Do they successfully achieve it or not? How do they use um, 
ethos or credibility, pathos or emotion, logos or logical reasoning, and kairos or timeliness to achieve their purpose to persuade their audience. So, so identifying and analyzing the rhetorical situation is a great step as you dig deeper and go beyond summary and start analyzing the piece you're critically reading. Um, another great thing is identifying patterns. So what are things you notice happening more than once? Maybe a word or an idea that is repeated or emphasized by the author. And when we go through our example on the next slide, I'll go into a little more detail talking about specific types of patterns, particularly key concepts and keywords. Um, this is a really great strategy um, you can do while annotating. So if you see words repeated multiple times and there may be new words to you or words that are used a little bit differently than how we typically understand them, highlight those and, and look them up or figure out what they mean in terms of how the author is using them and, and use that as a way to kind of decode, if you will, what the article is communicating. Analyzing the argument. So I think anytime we read something critically, we have to answer the questions. What is the author saying? What message are they communicating? Why are they doing this? And most importantly, ultimately, do I agree or not and why? And we, we really talked about this with rhetorical analysis last time. So you can see how now we're applying that strategy to a specific case of reading an article or watching a video or something we're reading with purpose and our purpose is to, to understand and, and see how the author might be trying to persuade us and then engage with that. Do we agree or not? Um, one way to do this is to play a game called the believing and doubting game. So do I believe this article or not? And one way to really take some time and mentally try to engage with that is to say, okay, what proof does the author have? Like essentially try to go through and prove the author's argument. And similarly with doubting, go through and try to disprove the author's argument. And if you do both believing and doubting and look at the evidence and play that tape to the end for both directions, you'll have such a deeper understanding of the piece and be able to have a better conclusion about ultimately whether you agree or disagree. So you can believe or doubt the thing you're reading, um, but if you try to do both and play the tape to the end and then come back and make your decision, you'll have a much stronger, more critically informed decision. Um, finally, the last thing I'll mention is considering the larger context. No one writes anything in a vacuum. For instance, if you write a piece right now, you got to consider or read a piece right now, you got to consider that it was produced, you know, during a global pandemic. That's going to influence the author in some way, even if that's not the main subject of the piece. So consider the context in which the work was produced, because that is inevitably going to have some influence on it. This goes back to what I said in the first lecture about how culture influences writers. And writers have power to create change, to influence culture. But when we're examining and understanding their works or examining ourselves and our motives for writing and creating and producing, we, we can't neglect the cultural influences that have influenced us. So these are the strategies I have for you for critical reading. Uh, hopefully you find them helpful as you read uh, more challenging and complex pieces, both in this class and other classes. We're going to move on to part two of the lecture and look at how to do this, these things with a specific example. Sam Anderson's just one more game.